welcome. My name is Michael Frederick. I'm the executive director of the Thoreau Society. And I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program, Interconnectivity, Birds as Teachers, a conversation with David Lindo and J. Drew Lanham. Our program is sponsored by the Thoreau Society, the Center for Biological Diversity, and the College of Idaho. Founded in 1941, the Thoreau Society is the oldest and largest organization devoted to an American author. You can register for our July annual gathering conference at thoreausociety.org. Dr. J. Drew Lanham is our keynote speaker. We will also be honoring Dr. Jane Goodall during the conference with the Thoreau Prize. The Center for Biological Diversity believes that the welfare of human beings is deeply linked to nature, to the existence in our world of a vast diversity of wild animals and plants. Visit them at biologicaldiversity.org. Founded in 1891, the College of Idaho is the state's first private liberal arts college. Visit them at collegeofidaho.edu. Let's celebrate Earth Week by welcoming renowned birders and authors, J. Drew Lanham and David Lindo. Our co-host, Rochelle L. Johnson, currently serves as the president of the Thoreau Society and is professor of environmental studies and director of the Gibson Honors Program at the College of Idaho. Rochelle has co-edited five books, including Thoreau in the Age of Crisis, New Essays on an American Icon. Her research has been supported by the Byneck Library, Idaho Humanities Council, and, and, the, and the NEH. She is writing a book about Susan Fenimore Cooper and environmental grief. Learn more at rochellejohnson.com. David Lindo, known as the Urban Birder, is a London-based broadcaster, writer, naturalist, photographer, and tour leader who works to inspire people to relook at urban environments and open their eyes, ears, hearts, and minds to connect with the nature around them. David is vice president of the Wild Fowl and Wetlands Trust, honorary president of the Columbia Bird Fair, and voted seventh most influential person in wildlife by BBC Wildlife Magazine. Visit David Lindo at theurbanbirderworld.com. You can order his new children's encyclopedia, The Extraordinary World of Birds, through the Thoreau Society at bookshop.org. J. Drew Lanham is an ornithologist, activist, and distinguished professor and master teacher of wildlife ecology at Clemson University and the poet laureate of Edgefield County, South Carolina. He uses speaking and writing about birding as an inspirational vehicle for connecting people to the outdoors. He has spent decades writing and speaking about the experience of black birders and has authored numerous essays on the connections between racism and extinction, continually working to make conversation more inclusive. You can order The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, Milkweed Press, at the shop at Walden Pond. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm Tiara Curry. I direct the Saving Life on Earth campaign here at the center, and I'm so excited about this webinar. I am on Shawnee Lance, and I use she pronouns. And I want to share a few slides with you about Earth Day. So it's the 52nd anniversary of Earth Day. And back when it all started, rivers were literally catching on fire. Oil was washing up on beaches. Things were looking pretty bleak. And people got together and organized. 20 million people were marching at the very first Earth Day, which was organized as a, as a series of teach-in events. And so this tradition is still going on today. That was before the major bedrock environmental laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. So a lot of things have gotten better since then. And even back then, the focus on Earth Day was inclusive. The, the founder, Gaylord Nelson, the senator from Wisconsin, said, our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty. 
The objective is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all other human beings and all other living creatures. And that should still be our goal today because some things have gotten better and some things have gotten much, much worse. Um, the first Earth Day was after Rachel Carson had published Silent Spring in the early 1960s. And in that book, she asked whether any civilization can wage relentless war on life without losing the right to be called civilized and without destroying itself. And I was reflecting on this because the Convention on Biological Diversity has been bumped twice, but it's happening. And when that kicked off last year, the UN Secretary General opened the whole thing by saying, we are losing our suicidal war against the nature. And so by harming the natural environment, we're harming ourselves. But we need bold and urgent action, but we've never had more tools to organize for that action. So even though we're entering an extinction crisis, we're in the midst of a climate crisis, a million species are at risk of extinction, common species are declining. There's so many actions that people can take. And so I wanted to just pick three personal actions, things like not using plastic, eating less meat, looking out for your carbon footprint, talking to other people, planting native plants for birds, um, and then policy actions not just not using plastic, but fighting so that plastic isn't produced anymore. Fighting for better conditions for the workers who make things. So personal actions, policy actions, and then I would like to challenge everyone to become an intersectional environmentalist. Leah Thomas sort of coined this term during the summer of 2020, and it, it's about environmental justice, but it's about more than that. It's about fighting for justice and human rights and the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis all together because it's all interconnected. So I'd like to challenge you to get involved with that and to learn more about all of these things. You can go to savelifeonearth.org. That's our landing page for our extinction crisis policy actions where you can see the things that we're promoting. So take oh and also um one way that we can fight to protect biodiversity and climate and for social justice all at the same time is to make sure that actions that are taken to help fight climate change don't harm biodiversity and there's a big one planned in Nevada right now it's a geothermal plant that's going into the habitat of an endemic toad the Dixie Valley toad it only lives there there's a virtual public meeting on May 9th where you can speak up for this toad. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. You can get information on our website or you can email me about that. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Rochelle. Thanks, Tierra. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to Griselda, who's behind the scenes here, uh, helping us manage the, the Q&A. Um, and we hope that people will put their, their questions in, uh, is it the chat? Tierra that we're doing or in the Q&A? Okay, so put your questions in the Q&A and we'll save time for those at the end. Um, I just wanna speak for a brief minute before handing things over to uh, David Lindo and to Drew Lanham. And I'm just so grateful to have them both here with us today. Um, I'm coming to you from Boise, Idaho, very close to Caldwell, Idaho, where the College of Idaho is. I divide my time between the College of Idaho and the Thoreau Society. Um, here uh, on Shoshone Bannock traditional lands and um, really so thrilled to be thinking about Earth Day in terms of thorough and birds and interconnectivity and what birds can teach us. Uh, David made a, such a contribution to my work when I had some recordings of uh, birds from a, a wetland in England and didn't know what they were because I don't know my, my British birds well enough. And David was kind enough to identify them. And uh, now I'm spending some time with Drew here at the College of Idaho this week. So I'm thrilled to have you together. Thoreau was really aware of the relationship between the personal and political and the personal and the political and the environmental. And we think of him as a social activist um, as a reformer, a social reformer, but also as a really prescient environmental thinker. And I wanted to just offer a couple of uh, things that he said about birds, um, maybe as a, um, a means of inspiration. I'm always looking for excuses to quote Henry David Thoreau. Um, but a particularly poetic thing that he wrote once about birds 
he wrote in his journal, the bluebird carries the sky on his back. Another thing that Thoreau knew about birds was that they were great connectors of humanity and of landscapes, um, and that they were great connectors across time, that they united people and places um, through the ages. And I, it's challenging for me to think about that notion of the bluebird carrying the sky on his back, um, given the changing migration patterns and the face of climate change of, of bluebirds. So, uh, so many birds returning earlier um, to, their, to their summer homes and some now uh, living year round like bluebirds are close to Thoreau's Concord, which they um, didn't used to be. We also remember Thoreau though for his environmental ethic and um, he writes in another place in his journal, he who cuts down woods beyond a certain limit exterminates birds. And in this age of um, vanishing species, but also dwindling bird populations, um, those, those words are, are such a good reminder to us. So um, David and Drew, I'm gonna turn things over to David, who's gonna speak for a bit about birds and interconnectivity, birds as teachers. Um, and after about 10 minutes, um, Drew will do that and then they'll be in some conversation together and then we'll turn to your questions. So thanks so much for being with us, David and Drew and all of you out there. David. Thank you. Um, firstly, I want to thank everyone for inviting me to be here today. Um, it's a great honor. And also it's a, a massive honor for me to be hanging out in the same space as Drew albeit in the atmosphere or whatever, but uh, he's one of my major inspirations in the US, so it's really good to be here with him, but everyone else as well. But um, it's interesting, this whole idea about interconnectivity and birds as teachers, because, you know, it's interesting to think about it, because for me, birds are teachers, and I, I didn't really kind of think about it in those terms until I was approached to do this. Um, but they are teachers, but the problem is we have to be taught to learn how to be taught by birds. Um, and that's how people like myself and Drew and many, many others are out there trying to, to talk to people, trying to engage with people to get them to understand and to open their eyes and hearts. Um, as a child, um, I came to be interested in natural history. God knows how, to be honest, I was, I just had this innate interest, which came from nowhere, but it was difficult because I was in uh, an area in Northwest London, which was predominantly black and Irish. And none of the people around me, my family, friends, their friends, no one had an interest in natural history. And I had this innate interest. And it was, it was, well, actually I say it was hard. It wasn't because for me, it was just part of being normal is my natural sort of setting. But for other people, it wasn't normal, of course. And I used to get a lot of ribbing to say the least from some of my um, peers in primary school. Um, even well, especially to be honest, black kids. I remember black kids coming to me in their false Atois accents, even though I knew they were born in London like I was, um, and telling me that I was English and that, you know, what am I doing being interested in birds? And I remember saying to them, even at a very young age, well, at least I'm doing something different. What are you doing? Um, I learned how to run very quickly, of course. Um, but it was interesting because birds were very much a sanctuary for me to, to, to go into nature, which actually for me was in a city. It wasn't going to some far flung piece of countryside. It was actually my, my backyard initially. And then, you know, on my bike going to local park, that was my, my kind of release. I realized from a very early age, even though I didn't actually realize that I was being immersed in nature right in the middle of where I lived. And I think the birds, taught me to be not afraid of who I was. And it taught me to be comfortable in my skin. And I think that was reinforced quite weirdly by the fact that at the time there was 
quite a lot of racism, nothing like in the US, but there was quite a lot of racism in terms of, you know, name calling and stuff like that. And I had that on a daily basis um, between the ages of five to 15. So, you know, it's a daily thing and I got so used to it, but I realized that when I kind of got myself out of it, even if it just meant spending some time almost meditating, looking out of my, my, my bedroom window into the backyard and seeing birds, it actually connected me with something far more important, something far more powerful, something far more, you know, it's something that was strong and gave me strength and made me realize that, you know, I need to talk to some of these people because they, I don't think they actually get what they're doing here. You know, you're not, we're supposed to be enjoying stuff here, not, not, uh, not attacking each other. So I guess during my life, um, I mean, I, I started being professional in terms of, you know, being the urban bird or whatever about 16 years ago, but I think all the stuff that happened between that age of five to now kind of built up to help me sort of try and conduct myself now. And my work for me is not about trying to convert people um, into becoming birders. Um, I'm more interested in talking to people who never ever even considered, even considered looking at bird. And I remember back in 2015, or 2014 actually, I had this idea um, to create a, a national vote to try and get people in Britain to vote for a national bird because America's had one since whenever, you know, since Benjamin, um, Benjamin Franklin was in charge. Um, so it's a long time. We've had obviously the bald eagle, even though it could have been in Turkey, as you know. Um, but with Britain, um, we didn't really have one. There was uh, the Britain's favorite bird, which was the robin, which was, was not even voted on. It was actually just foisted upon us. So I wanted to actually make it a clear election to find out, you know, who was actually the, the favorite. But to be honest, that wasn't my whole kind of idea. But the main idea was to get people who never even thought about talking about birds to talk about birds. And what was interesting was that during the course of the, um, I think the whole campaign was about six months, during the course of the six months, right at the very end when people had to vote, I timed it so that it was at the same time as a general election in Britain as well. And I also knew that a general election would be really boring for the media and to have something else as, as a and finally moment would, would, you know, hopefully boost it. And it did, you know. I managed to convince someone to, to be a PR person for me and she managed to get between six to eight million pounds worth of free space on television, um, in the newspapers and radio to talk about this bird vote. But what was interesting at the end of it, I managed on my own practically, apart from the help from my friends and stuff, uh, I managed to get um, nearly a quarter of a million people to vote, of which 60% 60 were not members of any NGO, they were not members of any conservation body at all. There were people on the street. And I found that really interesting because it showed that if you, if you reach out, but in a way that people can kind of understand and you're talking in their language, then great things could possibly happen. And I think it's really important that we kind of keep an eye on that because a great opportunity came and as I say it's an opportunity I mean obviously it came out of something really terrible which was the pandemic but I noticed in the pandemic that many people because they were at home and they were frightened they turned to nature and some of them didn't realize but they gained strength and I can identify with that immediately because that was how I felt even though I didn't realize I was feeling that as a kid when I was feeling a bit kind of hounded and by going into nature, I realized that actually there's this great thing out there that can give you, give you so much strength and make you feel so great. So for me, birds are teachers, you know, they teach us, they teach us to love. They teach us to love ourselves. They teach us to love others. 
I think they teach us to love the moments in our lives. And when we have bad moments, we know that there's going to be good moments coming again. So they teach us to understand and to love those moments, but ultimately to teach us to love life. And I think that, you know, that's what I talk about when I'm trying to engage with people. It's not even about birds. It's about love. It's about getting people to, to love because there's so much out there to love. And it really breaks my heart every time I turn on the television or, you know, read a newspaper, or look at some news on the, on, on, on social media. And it's just this terrible stuff happening all the time. And I'm thinking, why, why it doesn't need to be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. So for me, I, I feel like I'm probably one of the luckiest men on two legs or what luckiest person, people on two legs, because I just, I've managed to find this channel, which has made me feel so good. And, I, and I, 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 saw, I saw something on TV today, actually, when people talking about being lost. And I feel so lucky that I, I, found, I managed to find myself, even though, it was late, even though it was late in life, I found myself. And I think that through birds, you can actually do that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be even about birds or even conservation. It could be just to open that door to another, to another world, which you may not have discovered before. So birds have been good to me, and I think that we should be good to them. And I think that if that happens, then, you know, we'll be living in a much better world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. That was so inspiring. Drew? Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Tierra. Thank you, Michael Frederick. And um, to my great friend, David Lindo, uh, who's on the other side of the world, you know, we, David, we, it seems like we've been connected much longer than we have in that first, I think in Texas, um, actually. And so I've, I've watched your work and, and, and understood, even though we're on opposite sides of the globe, we're, we're really kind of working for the same thing. Right. And, um, and because we're both bird brains, that means that birds have connected us, you know, birds are teaching us things about as you said about ourselves, but also about one another. So thank you for your, for your message and for really broadening the ranges of birds beyond geographical or e ecological boundaries. I mean, you've made, you've made it a global thing. So birds, birds, I think one of the things that they do for all of us is that they make the world smaller in ways. Um, you know, I, I fell into birds in part because I envied flight, as, as many people do. And so um, I wanted, I wanted to, to sort of have that power to just lose the bounds of gravity and to travel to wherever it was that I chose. Sometimes it was imagining these places that the birds were going, learning as I did later on that scarlet tanagers, for example, were in tropical rainforest or that some of the waterfowl that I was seeing was headed to the top of the world and to Arctic realm. And so birds sort of inspired and taught this, this sense of, of wonder, but to be beyond myself, um, to, to understand that there was, was so much more to this earth than just the, the space on which I stood um, but that they knew a world and saw it from a different perspective. And so coming to birds in that way through envy, really, um, and through wonder, really gave me this, this sense of awe um, that has remained to this day. And so though I'm many decades removed from when I started birding, uh, bird watching really at, I don't know, six or seven years old, um, here I am really in many ways with that same child's mind um, that allows me to look skyward at a bird and to be inspired. And even though I may know the ecology of that bird as an ornithologist and have some idea ultimately maybe where it might be headed, I can't know that bird's mind. I can't know that bird's feelings in that moment, um, but I can know awe through observing, observing them. And so 
they, 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 they teach us to be outside of ourselves, which as David said, really, I think is important frequently. You know, we can talk about the importance of certainly in being introspective and knowing ourselves, but then there are also the times I think that we need to sort of be humbled in our place in the world and to understand that you don't have to wear a cape to be superlative. If you have feathers and wings, um, I think that makes you so. And I, 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 I go to this sort of immediate moment as I'm out here in um, Boise, out of Idaho and spending time at the College of Idaho with my friend Rochelle. And that first day on campus as I came here, and it's a place that I had come really um, with a little bit of trepidation because what um, the headlines and media had taught me was that this was not a place for me, that it was a place that I needed to fly by or fly over. And so on that first day in meeting Rochelle, there was this trepidation of being in this new range that I did not know. But upon meeting her and her countenance and her welcoming and her reassurance, but then in entering the campus and meeting her students in an environmental sciences class and being watched over by David, get this, nesting Cooper's hawks that were right above our heads, um, that those birds were giving witness to our conversations, but those birds were again inspiring. Um, they were helping me understand really this, this, this acceptance and teaching me to be in a moment and to give experience and opportunity rather than perception the precedent. So it's important to experience, I think, and birds teach us that. They, I think they lend purpose to our lives if they will allow us and, and teaching us to, to be sort of, again, creatures of the moment. And so that's how this visit started here. And from that time, my range has been expanding and that range has been expanding in, in some pretty marvelous ways. So just a few moments ago before we logged on here, um, I, I'll show you a picture here, but I'm not sure that it can be clearly seen. Um, that's in a very wild space, right? Those are two Canada geese um, that are winging their way somewhere. I mean, all you see there is clouds and sky and wings um, to fly. And here these birds go. Well, where were we? We weren't in some wild space, David. We were in an urban space. But more specifically, we were at the Anne Frank Memorial. Well, part of the trepidation that I had in coming to Idaho was that it had been billed as a hate-filled space, a space where people like me should not dwell. But here we are, were in this monument to tolerance, this monument, David, to love, this monument to free expression, to bring others together, inspired by someone who did not live beyond hate because she was snuffed out by it, but left words instructive to us. And as I have tears running down my eyes, being in this place and understand that I'm being taught in ways to unlearn what had been given to me as sort of not even half the story, these geese fly over. And those geese in that moment were just this ultimate expression of beauty and grace and freedom and love. And so birds teach me that. They teach me passion, they teach me purpose. Um, they certainly teach us persistence as they survive and sometimes thrive in the face of all that not just nature throws at them, but all that we throw at them. And so being in this memorial, this very human sort of centered space, I recognize my place as someone responsible for others and not just human others, but for bird others and other beasts. And so birds and being conduits for care. 
is how I like to see it, that they can teach us things if we allow ourselves, as you said, David, to be taught, if we open our minds, certainly, but more importantly, I think, is to also open our hearts in ways that allow us to feel, that allow us to not only give love, but to, but to accept it. And so those geese flying over that Anne Frank memorial really took me to a place of peace in a world that wants to be at war. It took me to a place of comfort in a place where I had always thought about fear. And so I'm thankful to birds for being teachers, for being conduits for better. And from that boyhood time, for taking me to a space of knowing that I have a place on this earth that's alongside, not greater than, not less than, but equal to. So I'm grateful for that. Thank you so much, Drew. Birds is joy, birds is love, birds is inspiration. Uh, and birds as occupying this atmosphere, David, that yeah, we're all occupying on Zoom, right? Like birds in the atmosphere. Um, we've got some time for you two to talk to one another. So I'm just gonna be quiet and, and let you do that. The thing but is- you've got questions for one another. David. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, I mean, eloquent as ever, Drew, and great words that resonate. And it, you know, it, it just sort of um, hammers home the fact that we are all ambassadors, you know, not just for birds, but we're ambassadors for humanity. And you and I are ambassadors for black people as well, but we're also ambassadors for people around the world as everyone is, you know, it's not a racial thing in the end of the day, it's for everyone. And I just wish that more people would see birds and nature as a symbol that we need to, to actually take heed of, you know, because I think um, Tiara in her, in her um, presentation, um, one of the quotes there, talking about, you know, this insane suicidal war against nature. I mean, if I was an alien looking down on this planet, I'd be thinking, what the, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, that it, it is, you know, and that's the thing, um, you know, for a moment, as you know, and, and here we are, I, I'm not going to say we're coming out of a pandemic, I think we're learning to live with you know, this iteration of it, whatever the variants are out there now. Um, but, but for many people, um, birds provided an escape, uh, a distraction, whether or not they knew the names of them or not. Um, and, and so I was, I was thrilled the other day um, in, in my travels, I looked out um, of the window, I think I was in Vermont at the time, and I was high up. And of course I had been scanning all these buildings for peregrine falcons. Um, but then there were these birds that were flying and they were doing these amazing things and they were just beautifully powerful flyers and they were pigeons, right? And they were rock pigeons. There were these birds that people frequently overlook. And so um, standing there for a moment, watching these birds and accepting those birds for who, not just what, but who it is that they are gives us some perspective, I think, on place. And, you know, as you talk, David, about ambassadors, right? Birds, um, they, they can teach us. They can, in many ways, lead us. But I thought about those pigeons that, in many cultures for a very long time, have been symbols of hope and peace, but that people dismiss them frequently because they're in cities or that they're very common. But if you just take a moment to watch a pigeon fly, you know, through those canyons of concrete and steel, um, you sense a certain power and freedom in those very birds. And, and that's a lesson in itself, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I talking about pigeons, I went from loving them to actually ignoring them, as you said, and I'm back on a love tip again. Because, as you <laughs> said, they are so graceful. And I think they're, 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 they're a good emblem um, for, they're a good sort of uh, portal. They're a, a good way of entry into nature. They're, 
in front of us, people can see them. Um, I think it's so important that we look at the, the stuff in front of us. You know, I've got this personal vendetta, not vendetta, but I'm really, in Britain, um, the natural history industry, the television stuff you watch, the documentaries, it's all about stuff over there somewhere. Uh, Nothing uh, about what's in front of you. And yeah. there's no connection. So I'm, I'm sure you've heard of David Attenborough. I mean, his programs, you know, amazing. Each one, the bar gets raised higher and higher to the point where it just becomes entertainment. Um, you know, and I, I saw that exemplified because there's a program on television in Britain called Google Box, Google Box even. And it's when they have cameras in people's houses and they're just watching TV and they're just commenting. And there was a, a, a section of the program where they showed the David Attenborough clip where uh, I think Elizabeth was running across the beach being chased by tons of snakes. And it was, oh, oh my God, I'm a, you know, everyone's getting all excited about it. And then it's gone, the clip's done, and then they move on. No one's asking the question, oh, where was that? And are they any living here? You know, there's no kind of connection. And I think that the way that nature is sold to us makes us even more, um, this, you know, a, 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 apart from it, basically, because it's over there. You know, we don't have to worry about it. We can still do our polluting here because the Serengeti's fine. Yeah, that's, man, you said a ton there because, you know, nature being sold wildness, especially being sold as the far away, right? When um, we have the nearby far away, if we'll just look skyward sometimes or pay attention to the sparrow in the thicket that's right at the edge of the yard or in the park. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think about um, Henry David Thoreau and and sort of his heroism here, and you know he's known for all of this time around this pretty small lake, um, and and you, but but that he had a time to know this place, to know his patch, so to speak, and to fall in love with that place. I think um, it breeds an intimacy a care, a love for a place that isn't so far removed to say, oh, well, I can observe nature if I go there, as opposed to observing nature where I am. And so birds can bring that to us if we're patient, um, if we are persistent, if we watch. You know, birds can, they, they can teach us all sorts of lessons. But then, David, I think one of the things that thrills me most about birds and, and that I hear in your voice is that wonder sometimes of what you can't even know. Look, dude, I've, I've watched you on some of these videos and I know there are some of these birds that you've probably seen a thousand times and it's like you're looking at them for the first time, right? And, and, you, and you don't lose that wonder. And I've never watched you dismiss a bird. I've never watched you just dismiss something and say oh well we've seen that let's keep going and see the next and and so that's that's a lesson in appreciation and slowing down and again in accepting what's in front of you rather than thinking beyond it to something better that's not to say we can't be aspirational but that's a lesson to me to see someone who's had experience all over the world saying yeah, wow, look at this. I, you know, and, and no one would know that you've seen, how many Stygian owls have you seen? <laughs> um, thousands, right? And, you know, here you are being amazed at the next one you see. So that's a lesson that you're teaching that the birds have taught you. So I, you know, how do you think, David, we, um, how do we expand? How can we better be better ambassadors for birds and, and human beings? What do you, do you have any suggestions for how to get better at this? I think, um, I mean, we can always get better without any doubt, as anyone can any, in any walk of life. But I think that we need better platforms. Um, I know, for for example, in the UK, I, I don't get the platform that I, I'd like to have because um, in Britain, uh, the way the natural history sort of 
industry works is that if you kind of fit the identikit of what a natural history person should look like, then you have more opportunity. And I found that, you know, because I, I mean, I was told under no uncertain terms a few years ago by the head of one of the, BB, one of the BBC channels, the reason why you're not, um, you know, we're not using you basically is because you haven't got an ology. You know, you need to go to university, um, come back in a couple of years time. And I was thinking, what, what's that about? It's about communicating, you know, it's about talking about experiences. It's about connecting with people, you know, end of the day, you can read a script. doesn't matter. It's about communicating. And, and I, I, I just, I just find it, I just despair because it makes it harder um, to, to try and um, to spread that message. The thing is from, from my point of view, I can, I, I can only speak from my point of view and also from my point of view in Europe. Um, I found that I realized very early on that the platform when it comes to TV is very limited. So therefore you have to find other ways you write, you do stuff on social media, you give talks, you lead. I mean, you do all these other things which then permeate in any way. And then eventually people come to you. So I, I think that, you know, we can all get better. We can all look around each other and, and, and get, you know, get inspiration from other people. Also people outside of our region, outside of our, our puddle, outside of our ocean, because I remember once someone said to me, oh, so who, who are your influences? You know, what, who, what people influenced you? And I said, well, actually, um, Prince was a major influence for me because I love the fact that he cut a path that at the time people derided him, but then now people are doing the same thing he did. And I love people like that who, 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 who cut their own path. It's the toughest thing to do because you're, 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 the, you're a pioneer and they, people like that really inspire me. Who inspires you, Drew? Wow. I, you know, um, th there, there are so many in so many different realms. David, when, when I think about it, you know, I think about someone like Henry David Thoreau and I, because he was someone who was a naturalist, but, but being, you know, we often hear this excuse that someone was a person of their time. Um, and, and Thoreau, as America was coming to this point of having to finally deal with the question of slavery, Henry David Thoreau did not quibble. He did not fall back. He did not say, well, I am a naturalist and that is all that I do. Henry David Thoreau stepped forward into the fray in a way um, that, quite frankly, too many people overlook, um, that people don't want to see sort of that heroic nature of him speaking up, of using his voice in a way um, to speak for equal um, treatment of human beings, regardless of, of, of race. And so, you know, he is someone who, who I admire. I think about Rachel Carson. Um, who, who was writing about birds in Silent Spring, who had this sort of very quiet demeanor on the outside, but on the inside, there was this passion burning for nature, but also this passion burning for, 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 for respecting nature in this way. And so when, when I think about those people um, who, who burn hot for a cause, and, and they are willing to go outside of the prescribed boxes that people would put them in, right? So somebody would say, you know, Lindo, um, get an ology and then you can be in our box. And you say, you know what? No, no thank you, I'm gonna make my own boxes um, and, and, and you can have yours. You know, that's something to admire. And I think, you know, sometimes when we see the bird out of its range, you know, here this time of year for the warbler to drop in our yard that we don't expect. Um, and then to look at that warbler, you can't look at that bird and just count it. You have to, you should look at that bird and wonder on its journey, on what it's had to survive to get to you in this place. And it may be out of its prescribed range, but in that moment, it is gracing you with its presence. And so I admire people who do that, who take the chance to to push forward. I'll tell you, um, it, 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 it may sound patronizing, but I'm thinking this week of how my attitude about a place 
that I was fearful of was changed by one person and in Rochelle Johnson taking the opportunity to create new boxes. So, uh, you know, I have a new hero. Um, and as I meet people who are willing to take chances that they haven't taken, those are people that I admire. Some of the students that I've met over the past few days, students who are far, far away from home, um, who are here um, in a place making themselves better. Those are people, the kind of people I, I admire. And so, wow, just, just so many. And yeah, guess what? I'm a Prince lover as well. Um, <laughs> you know, I, we, we, we'd have to go over a catalog of songs to find our, um, our favorites right now. I'm stuck on the beautiful ones, right? Um, I'm, I'm always on that tip, but it, it is, you know, with the sort of like being asked, what's your favorite bird? And my response, David, is the one with feathers because it's the next one that I see. Thanks to both of you. I'm sure we, I know I could, and I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone when I say that. I think I could listen to you two speak for a long, long time. We have um, quite a few questions in the Q&A, and so I'll turn things over to Tiara for, for that. Yeah, my brain and my heart are exploding right now. There's just so much, and there's so many great questions, too. I wish we had more time. I love so many of these questions. Um, to start off with, I'm going to go with, there was a student walking across campus today who's been into nature but doesn't know how to get started and ran into some students celebrating Earth Day and heard about this talk. And so that person asked, how do you start birding? Um, you, you know, you just look. You, you don't have to have binoculars. Um, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to have a field guide, but what you have to have is a feel guide. So as David has talked about love, you know, thumb through your heart, you know, find some affection for a bird that you see. Maybe you know the name of it, maybe you don't. Um, you can always find that name out. But my suggestion to people now is I really teach people to begin to establish their own personal ornithology their own personal ornithology, and to begin to know the birds as you want to know the birds, and then begin to layer in this knowledge that other people have added. And a red bird can pretty soon become a Northern Cardinal. Um, maybe red bird with black wings, you know, um, maybe eventually becomes a Scarlet Tanager, but to notice first is the first requisite. Just notice. I can't add to that. It's totally, totally what I'd say. And also the fact that, you know, as a kid, I didn't know what birds were either. And I used to call ba sparrows baby birds and starlings mummy birds. So, yeah. What was that and name for starlings? The starlings were mummy birds, mother birds, mummies. Mummy. <laughs> at the grocery store last week, there was a little kid pointing at an English sparrow and saying, chicken, chicken. And it just made me so happy because she was like, bird, chicken, okay, great. Um, so there's a question about how to teach children about birds and also how to do it over Zoom. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, um, I think to teach children about birds is basically what Drew has just been talking about. It's about forgetting about trying to worry about uh, what how you identify things and just to experience whatever's in front of you, whether, you know, whether you're listening to it or watching it and then to build a picture from there and to, to grow to, to, to like that bird and, and to do research on it, to find out what it is. Cause I always say to parents, you know, they worry about the fact they don't know what their kid's asking them to get the kid to do the research and teach them. We can all teach each other. Um, on Zoom, um, well, again, it's, it's about basically trying to, uh, to latch on to um, situations like this where people are talking about birding, but in a way that you can actually hook onto it as opposed to being very technical. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think one of the things that we do is sometimes we make the box so small um, for entry that it's hard for people to get in. I mean, we were talking about children uh, from the question, but I cannot tell you how many adults tell me that, yeah, I really want to get into bird watching, 
Um, and I mentioned, you know, you see, I'll use, I'll say birding and I'll say bird watching. Um, and, and there are these slight differences, I think, but I, I would like to say and, and tell people, you know, that, that, that you watch first, spend time with a bird, um, that, that child who is pointing at that sparrow and calling it a chicken, that child is noticing things and that are coming into its mind. Um, that help, will help it remember that bird. Yeah, it can, they can learn the name of the bird later if that's necessary, but that they are noticing things. And so not to make the boxes so small for children. So we're looking at one another in these small boxes now. Don't put birds into those small boxes. Um, let birds be the free beings that they are and the other learning comes behind it. Someone wants to know how to help birds besides keeping cats inside and if there are things people in cities in particular or people with small yards can do to help birds. I, you know, for, for me, um, yeah, cats are, I mean, that's, that's, that's a priority. I think the other thing is to begin to think about your yard, no matter how small, or the patch near you, some park or that space to never just see it as some insignificant small piece because birds are flying over landscapes that these patches that they have to stitch together in some sort of quilt. So to understand that your small patch can provide respite um, for a migrating bird, um, to think about your patch as a puzzle piece in a larger landscape. I think, um, and so in that way, you, we begin to work together, maybe, um, that, that one yard becomes two and so on and so on until we can sort of stitch together something, hopefully that, that birds find useful and help them to survive. So to see yourself as an integral part of it um, and to not say, well, my yard is so small, it's no good. Um, Y'all have to play our part. Your yard could never be small enough, to be honest, because there's so much you can do. You can make, um, you can actually plant your garden um, or your yard or your area um, with nature. So you can actually encourage nature to, to, to develop. And even if it's only one foot square, that is a jungle to an invertebrate. That's a, a jungle to a bug, you know? That brings in birds, that brings in all sorts of wildlife. You've got complete biodiversity in one square foot. And every square foot without pesticides is a, a godsend for butterflies, pollinators, birds, because the whole landscape is so contaminated. Um, someone asked about birds at a large scale, the decline over the past five decades and where that situation is going and, and what it means for us. I think it's a question for you, Drew, uh, given it's going to be America. Billions gone, right? Billions of, bir billions of birds gone. Science um, tells us that. And so I, the way that I help people understand that care is critical is that at some point in history, um, you know, a hundred and say 20 years ago, someone looked skyward and it was darkened by these birds and these birds would land in trees and they were so numerous that the branches would break off of the trees. Um, and they were so numerous that people would kill them by the millions and the birds would continue to come. And they were so numerous that people would turn swine herds in on the dead birds for the, for the swine to feed on and the birds continued to come. And then the birds began to dwindle, but yet people said the birds continue to come. And then in 1914, there was one bird left named Martha. And when Martha died, one of the most abundant birds on earth ceased to exist. And it's all because people took the common, they took the common for granted. And so I think the billions had, that have disappeared, um, yes, have been because of our carelessness, have been because of habitat destruction, have been because of pollution, have been because of us unleashing cats on the world uh, to kill billions of birds as well. But it's also been because we haven't shown concern about the common. And so that last passenger pigeon that died is emblematic of a carelessness, of letting your heart harden in a way that allows you to mistreat nature 
um, to, to desecrate it in this way so that uncountable becomes none. And that's the easiest number to deal with. So I just, I think care and understanding that the birds that you see, again, don't bypass what's in your yard for something that's far, far away that's exotic. I, we all love seeing different birds and traveling to see birds if we can. Different birds, that's fun. Um, but also to take time to sit back and to relax and to appreciate, as David says, those things in front of you. And I love his tack being the urban birder and teaching people to be in these spaces where they are and to see the birds there. That's important. Yeah, it, it is true. And also I think uh, on a sort of bigger scale in a way is to try and recreate habitat. And that starts in your backyard. That starts that one foot by one foot square patch of, you know, naturalness you're growing. You know, try not to create acres and acres of lawns, flat lawns, try and have some other beautiful things going on there. And that could bring in new species that have been dwindling, that can start to kind of, uh, you know, grow in number again. And also remember that once you start doing that, anything could turn up anywhere at any time. So even in the middle of the busiest of cities, you know, I've been in Los Angeles, Sunset Boulevard and seen a, a red belly, is it red belly sap sucker? I can't remember the name of the species, but it was a sap sucker on a tree in the middle of Sunset Boulevard. Anything to turn up anywhere at any time. So we only well, have a couple minutes. Oh, go ahead, Drew. No, I was saying, I think the bird probably came to watch David Lindo. Um, <laughs> birds do that, right? They show up and, and you'll see the birds looking and they're like, they're listing David Lindo because, you know, that's what they do. Yeah, that's because I ticked off Drew first. <laughs> We, we just have a couple minutes before we wrap up and I certainly don't want to cut this question short, but I want to make sure we get to it. Someone asked about the connection between racism and extinction and how individuals can counteract both of them. Huge question, two minutes. Yeah. Um, you know what? Um, both are both are hard hearted, right? Um, and again, we've been using this word that you won't find in a scientific journal, love. Both are, are largely, from a human-centered standpoint, the absence of love and care. That's what it comes down to. You got to care at some level. And that's all conservation is. But you can't be passive about it. You can't sit back and say, well, I can't speak up for human rights because I'm watching birds right now. You know, I, I, I tell people, that there were three witnesses that they probably don't think about that watched George Floyd die. There were likely pigeons, European starlings, and house sparrows that witnessed that. And so those birds, in a way, saw us at our worst. Um, I think we all deserve better than that, to care for one another, to care for nature. I can't add to that. Tierra, are we close to out of time here? Yeah, we have one minute. Okay, well, thank you all so much for, for being here. The Thoreau Society and the Center for Biological Diversity had its first conversation um, in honor of Earth Day last year, and we're so happy to be doing it again, and especially happy to be doing it with you, David, and you, Drew. What a remarkable, provocative, and inspiring conversation. Um, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so, so grateful to, uh, to celebrate Earth on this Earth Day with all of you. Much love, David. Listen, much love to everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Hope to see you soon. Absolutely.